one of the major options for patients who have early disease is surgical resection. The challenge, I think, is that some patients, a lot of patients, have liver cirrhosis, portal hypertension at our center, a platelet count under 100,000 would deem someone not a good surgical candidate. But a lot of patients are good surgical candidates. And for small tumors, at the same time, radiofrequency ablation can be very effective. Dr. Marshall, can you deal with us this debate about patients who are resectable, should they be resected, or should they undergo percutaneous ablation? Well, resection has long been the gold standard for tumors that are small, um, and even larger tumors. So uh, we've seen in the last few years data come out that shows that radiofrequency ablation can have similar outcomes with similar overall survivals uh, compared to surgical resection in tumors that are two centimeters or three centimeters and smaller, and especially those tumors uh, that are centrally located in which a large resection is necessary. Um, so there is an expanding role for radiofrequency ablation. There have been other tools that have been introduced, uh, especially microwave ablation. Microwave antennas have been refined, uh, and they can now produce a much more predictable and reliable ablation area. Uh, and indeed, we've seen some trials that have uh, some comparisons of microwave to radiofrequency ablation that show lower recurrence rates. Um, some are in the order of uh, 20% for radiofrequency ablation versus 10% for microwave ablation. So we will see, I think, an expanded role of microwave in the future. Now, it's important to talk about these, and this is a great topic to discuss along with liver transplantation, because now that we have these tools that can uh, provide patients who are too sick to, to have their tumors resected with a treatment option, we may have the ability to treat their hepatitis and actually improve their liver function over time. So we may be able to take some of these patients off the transplant list. That remains to be seen, uh, but it's important to focus on that in the future. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about combination therapies, um, especially combining TACE with an ablation therapy. We've seen that when we combine these therapies, we can actually achieve a much bigger ablation. So we can uh, treat a tumor and satellite nodules in the area um, more effectively than we could in the past. And so we are looking at these treatments right now. There have been some studies that have published some very good retrospective data, and there are some prospective studies that have been published showing larger ablation zones. And I think this will become a much better option in the future um, and much more heavily utilized. Yeah, I don't In your center, is everybody getting taste followed by RFA? Is that a standard approach? At, at my center, we're trying to combine therapies whenever possible. There's a lot of debate right now uh, about how to sequence these therapies whether to do them both at the same time, to do one prior to the other. Um, so it remains to be seen what is the best treatment for this. But whenever we can, in patients with small tumors um, and tumors up to five centimeters, we're trying to combine the therapies because the data has shown that this is better than any one therapy alone. So I, I think probably the jury is still out on that. Uh, like you said, most of this is retrospective data. Uh, the randomized data I don't think have been super robust.